So I'm Eric Wishhouse. Uh, I'm a HHMI investigator and a professor at Princeton University. And in the first part of this presentation, I have already talked to you about how the Drosophila embryo develops, and in particular, how spatial patterns of, of gene expression and cell behavior arise. And one of the things we saw was the importance of maternal RNAs and maternal proteins that are localized in particular regions of the egg and provide positional information to the cells that are, are found in, in individual positions. What I'd like to do in this second part of the lecture is to actually focus in a little bit more on these maternal RNAs. And in particular, I'd like to talk about some work that a graduate student, Thomas Greger, has done in the, in the lab uh, in, uh, in collaboration with two biophysicists at Princeton, Bill Bialik and David Tank. And I think the reason that I wanted to talk about these experiments is that they provided a, a, a wonderful example, I think, of the importance of to us as biologists right now, beginning to try to view problems more quantitatively, to try to establish actual numbers for the biological phenomena that we have come to understand in a vagueish kind of cartoon way, but that it's, if we want to bring our knowledge to the next level, if we want to test our understanding, one of the things that we really have to be able to do is to measure and supply numbers. And the experiments that I'm uh, going to present, although you'll see they're not fully complete and the numbers, uh, are the, in several cases, even when one has numbers, one still has to struggle with the meaning for those numbers. I think the important thing is the direction that they point out. So, what we saw and what we've learned in the past 20 years in Drosophila development is that patterning along the anterior to posterior, that is head to tail axis of the embryo, depends on the presence of a maternal protein called bicoid that's graded, such that individual genes like hunchback are activated at particular times, at, a, at, a, at this, uh, particular places in, in, uh, in the embryo. Now, the interesting thing about this information-rich uh, maternal gradient of bicoid protein is that it arises from the synthesis of the bicoid protein from a localized RNA at the anterior end of the egg. And it's that process that I'd like to talk about. And what we were interested in, what Thomas in particular was interested in, was in this simple cartoon sense of how an information gradient like bicoid arises. You have a localized RNA synthesis and then movement of the protein. And most of our knowledge and all the pictures that you see back there are were made in fixed embryos where you fix an embryo, you stain it with something that allows you to see protein, particular proteins like bicoid protein or uh, do in situ hybridizations to identify the localization of the RNA. And those that approach of fixed material has been extremely valuable in, all, in almost all the development of biology over the past 20 years. But it has two essential flaws. One is that most of these techniques are, are indirect, so you don't see the molecule itself. You see something that binds to something that binds to something that binds to the molecule, and you're never really sure then about the, linea the levels of staining or the intensity of the staining that you see and how that relates to absolute concentrations. And in a model like the one we're dealing with here where the fates of cells are controlled by concentrations that you want to measure, you would really like to have as direct as possible a measure of uh, the actual concentration in a given region of the embryo. The other problem with fixed material obviously is that it's fixed. You look at a given embryo, it is fixed at a given stage. Even if you can measure it at that stage, you don't really know what the levels were before or afterwards. And so for those reasons, what Thomas Greger decided to do in the lab was to develop a living probe, a probe that could allow us to follow the bicoid protein in living embryos. And to do that, he established a fusion protein of bicoid to the, the fluorescent EGFP protein and 
uh, followed its development in embryos. And I think we'll show you that in the next images. And these are actually living photographs at different levels of a single Drosophila embryo that expresses this uh, EGFP bicoid uh, transgene that Thomas Greger made. Now, the transgene that he made is under control of the normal bicoid transcription controls during oogenesis. It also has the normal 3' UTR of the bicoid RNA, which is the part of the RNA that's involved in localizing that RNA to the anterior end of the egg. And so this RNA is expressed during, the, in the, the EGFP bicoid is expressed as RNA in the mother, localized appropriately. And in fact, if you put it into a mutant embryo, mutant for bicoid, it will rescue and produce perfectly uh, normal development indistinguishable from that that you see in wild type embryos. Now, while I've been talking, this embryo has established a bicoid gradient. And I think what we need to do is to go uh, back one time and watch this movie one more time. So what we're going to see is uh, the bicoid gradient in this living embryo. And at the, when the embryo immediately after fertilization, you can see some movement in the cytoplasm here. What you can't see yet is an obvious difference in the concentration of fluorescence at the anterior end and the posterior end. And over time, though, you can begin to see over the, the two-hour period of time when this, uh, this is the nuclei have now made it out to the surface, and you can see in those nuclei that are at the anterior end of the egg, you can see an accumulation of bicoid. You can see that, that when the nuclei divide, the bicoid protein goes out of the nuclei. When the nuclei reform after each division, the bicoid protein goes back in. What you can clearly see in this embryo is that along the anterior or posterior axis of the egg, there's a graded distribution such that nuclei at this end have much more bicoid protein and the protein levels drop off such that a cell really could figure out where it was in the egg whether it was the hundredth cell at this end, or the zero cell, or the one cell, or the tenth cell, just based on what, it, what its position is here. Now, using this construct, because we can accurately time and say exactly how old the embryo is, how many minutes it's been since it's done any particular division, we can image these embryos with uh, two-photon microscopy that allows us to get very good in-depth resolution. We're able to, and because we're actually looking at EGFP bicoid, we're looking at the protein that is actually responsible for the pattern. We can measure the intensity, and we can measure the profile of the gradient. So what it allows us to do is to ask relatively simple questions. If the RNA is localized at the anterior end of the embryo and uh, begins translation at fertilization. Protein is being made. If translation is continuous, if the embryo is always making more and more bicoid protein, then how is it, what, how does the, the, the profile of bicoid uh, concentration along the length of the embryo change? Does it continue to rise? Does it stabilize? Stabilization would be actually really important because if a nucleus wants to know where am I along the anterior posterior axis of the egg, the easiest way of doing that is if the concentration at that point, at 30% egg length, really were constant and were constant over time. So one of the things that Thomas has, by following individual embryos from the time when the nuclei first migrate out to the surface, and you can measure the big rate concentration to later, measuring in exactly the same position, even when nuclei divide, looking at the nucleus, that the daughter nucleus that comes to lie closest to the position of the mother nucleus, and ask, does the, when does the concentration in a given area stabilize? And what Tumbus found, and this was quite remarkable, is that at the earliest points when we could measure the RNA, that is, at cycle 10, just when the, after 10 cycles, so just when the nuclei made it out to the surface, the concentration in a given nucleus was fixed for that position and remained constant at that position uh, and remained constant throughout all the remaining cleavage divisions. That is, the, the concentration is stable all the way up to cycle 14 when we see massive visible expression 
of the downstream targets. The other thing that was really important for us was to look at many embryos on the same slide and ask, in 10 different embryos, if you look at the big white concentration, how similar is this concentration at 30% from one embryo to the next to the next? Because we know that ultimately all 10 embryos will develop with exactly the same gene expression patterns. And so if the concentration of bicoid really is directly reflecting, the con uh, or is directly controlling those uh, gene expression patterns, then in individual embryos, somehow at 30% egg length, you've got to have the same bicoid concentration in all those different embryos. And quite remarkably, and uh, something that we had never really been able to convincingly see in fixed material because of the variabilities of fixation and staining, there's very, very little variation from one embryo to the next. And all of those observations were really important because it pointed out to us then that bicoid and the nuclear concentration of bicoid can provide stable, sufficient information about position to activate precise patterns of gene expression and that it could do this from cycle 10 all the way up to cycle 14. Now, another thing that you can do if you believe that you can actually measure the concentration of a molecule is you can actually measure and describe the distribution. And if you look at the big white uh, distribution in uh, embryos, what you can see is that it's, as expected, highest at the anterior end and falls. And you can show that this fall is it can be fitted to an exponential uh, decay, which is what one would predict if you had a source and you had simple diffusion from that source. And because the uh, concentrations are so reproducible, particularly in the region right here where we're activating hunchback gene expression, you can measure those concentrations, measure the concentration of bicoid in a given nucleus and the output of that concentration in terms of hunchback protein expression. One of the interesting things is that the, uh, if you look in these embryos at, at, at precisely at the region where hunchback is being expressed right here, and you um, ask how much of a difference is there in bicoid concentration in nuclei between those that are going to express hunchback and those that aren't going to express, it's basically a 10% difference. The, accurate, the, the cells that are making the choices, their neighbors will be either uh, completely, will not express bicoid protein or, uh, or not express hunchback protein or express hunchback protein based on only a 10% change in the concentration of bicoid. So what that means is that cells have an extraordinary ability to measure accurately what these concentrations are. You can plot out that, that response. You can see that it's highly precise, meaning it occurs precisely hunchback expression within one or two cell diameters at 48% egg length, and that it's also highly nonlinear, meaning that a small change in bicoid concentration results in a huge on-off change in the response to uh, in terms of gene activities. So you could think about how this nonlinearity arises. And there's uh, a number of experiments from a, a number of different labs that indicate that, uh, that if you look at the control regions of the hunchback gene, that there are multiple bicoid binding sites. And you can begin to think about this in terms of, of cooperativity of bicoid binding. And when you do that, you model the nonlinearity. You come up with a, a Hill coefficient for this co cooperativity of 5, which is a very high degree of cooperativity, which means that, um, that there's very little change in, again, very little change in bicoid results in uh, uh, massive changes in, uh, in gene expression. Now, all of these are the relative numbers, because really, if you think about what we're doing when we're looking at these embryos, is we're looking at EGFP. We're measuring the EGFP that is attached to individual bicoid molecules, measuring the intensity of the signal, and trying to extrapolate to concentrations of functional protein in the nucleus that are activating genes. What we'd really like to be able to do is not to talk about bicoid concentration in terms of intensity, but to actually talk about it in terms of number of molecules, in terms of absolute concentration. 
And the experiment that Thomas did to begin to approach this is something that you can do uniquely in flies, uh, in part, uh, or at least it was easier to do in flies, is that we're using EGFP in many organisms. You can use EG, uh, P to tag proteins in many organisms. But fly embryos develop inside a water impermeable but completely transparent eggshell called the vitellin membrane. And so what Thomas was able to do was to take these EGFP labeled bicoid embryos and immerse them and image them in a solution with a defined molarity of bicoid. In fact, 36 nanomolar bicoid. And so the, what this meant is that he could look at the concentration or measure the intensity of the signal, the bicoid EGFP signal inside the embryo and compare it to an absolute uh, concentration of bicoid immediately outside the embryo. And this allowed in them to show that the actual concentration of bicoid in nucleus, in those nuclei that are actually making the choice whether to activate hunchback expression or not, was of the range of something like uh, 8 nanomolar. That's an interesting number because it's close to what might be predicted from in, in vitro binding studies for what would be required uh, for activating uh, and binding to and uh, activating the hunchback gene. But it's actually interesting from a, a, an additional standpoint, one that raises, I think, one of the really fundamental questions about transcription. If you take the concentration of bicoid, this 8 nanomolar value, and you know the actual volume of the nucleus, because you can measure that just from the optically from the, the images that you have, you can calculate the total number of bicoid molecules in the nucleus, in a nucleus that's making a decision. When Thomas did that, he found that there were about 690, 700 molecules per nucleus. This is a remarkably small number, uh, if you think about it. Uh, 600 or 700 molecules in a nucleus. If we consider that the neighboring nucleus that is um, choosing not to activate hunchback, or is choosing to activate hunchback, uh, has only varies by 10%. And so uh, what it requires is that individual nuclei distinguish between whether in their total nuclear volume there's 700, 690 molecules or 630 or 770. The relatively small number of, mole of bicoid molecules that are present in the nuclei that are making accurate decisions raises a lot of questions about how bicoid or how any transcription factor controls uh, or active air transcription in a concentration-dependent way. Part of the question is we don't really know, uh, we assume that bicoid activates transcription of hunchback by binding to a hunchback control region and activating transcription by interacting with other proteins that are the actual uh, transcriptional activators. What we don't know about bicoid and hunchback is the extent of this binding or occupancy, how long it lasts, and whether it's permanent, the associated with when genes are active, whether bicoid molecules that are bound are permanently, are, are, are the bicoid molecules responsible for that activation remain permanently bound, or whether there's a dynamic exchange between bicoid and individual uh, uh, transcription factors. And that becomes important because actually hunchback is not the only gene in the Drosophila genome that can respond to, to bicoid transcription. And there are various informatics estimates suggest that there's anywhere from uh, several thousand based on informatics to uh, uh, several hundred based on biochemical studies, uh, several hundred genes capable of binding to and responding to bicoid. So if all of these genes are trying to measure bicoid concentration and binding bicoid concentration at the same time, and there are only 630 molecules in the nucleus, the question of occupancy becomes really important. And it drives us to models where what's actually required is to, for cells to make choices is that the uh, <coughs> concentrations are based, are, not, are, are based in some way by averaging collisions over time, averaging interactions between bicoid molecules over time such that molecules, diffuse, uh, molecules of bicoid diffusing throughout the nucleus will bind 
or interact with the promoter and then leave and be able to interact with other, other genes in the genome. But to measure concentration in those molecules, what, you'd ha what you have to be able to do is you have to have uh, some memory, some way of recording individual collisions and averaging them over time to come up with an accurate uh, uh, measurement of, of, of time, of, of concentration. The problem is actually, to, to make the problem graphic, just one last uh, uh, cartoon-like illustration, but what a nucleus or what a hunchback gene, what any gene in a nucleus has to do with response to transcription is similar to what a piece of DNA or, or say my knuckle here would have to do if sitting in the middle of this room where I'm giving this talk, if there were 600 and 90 molecules of bitcoin flying around. It is trying to judge from collisions how many molecules are actually in this room and trying to, to figure out whether it is in a room with 690 or 630 because its activation is going to depend on that. And other pieces of DNA, if we accept the, uh, the uh, transcriptional threshold model, uh, if we accept the idea that the bitcoin gradient is providing pattern along the entire axis of the embryo. Other genes are responding and measuring concentrations are sensitive to activation at other concentrations. So one of the other things that we don't know, and I think it's really important to know about uh, the whole response, is to get a more global sense of what genes respond to bicoid, how do they respond, and uh, are they, do they show the same levels of accuracy and their ability to measure molecules. One possibility would be that the embryo uses certain genes, like hunchback, as guideposts, establishes them accurate, with great accuracy, and then determines other genes which appear to respond, like the, these genes that I've listed here, this orthodentical giant or cripple, appear to also, obviously are also responding in some way to the bicoid gradient, but uh, whether they make whether those responses are necessarily as accurate as hunchback or whether part of the accuracy, if they are as accurate, whether the part of that accuracy depends on interactions uh, or subsequent interactions that depend heavily on the uh, interactions of guidepost genes like hunchback. The way that the Bicoy gene activates transcription is a fascinating problem, but it's not the only thing that we don't know. Another in really interesting problem is how it is that um, the gradient is actually established in a stable form. How does bicoid protein move? If it's being made at the anterior end of the egg, how does that movement of bicoid protein from the site of its synthesis, uh, how is that able to establish a stable gradient? And in particular, in the simple cartoon models that we have, that those protein molecules, which are not, unlike the RNAs, are not anchored, would be able to move by diffusion. So what we'd like to know is, are there, what, are the, what are the mechanisms that actually move uh, uh, bicoid molecules newly made from the anterior end and establish the gradient? In simple kinds of experiments where you follow the establishment of the gradient over time, look at how molecules, when you, how soon you can begin to detect molecules at different list, distances from the anterior end of the egg, or you mo and you model the kinds of diffusion constants, the rates that molecules have to move uh, within the egg to establish a stable gradient. Most of the modeling that's been done suggests that you need diffusion constants of the order of about four to eight microns squared per second. Once we had an EGFP bicoid molecule, though, that allowed us to do photobleaching experiments or to tag individual molecules and follow them, what Thomas Greger was able to do was to actually measure the movement of bicoid molecules in, in small little spaces using photobleaching experiments and over small volumes and over small times to ask how fast does bicoid uh, molecules actually move in the surface. And the remarkable conclusion, the one that was surprising to all of us, was that when he, if you look at those movements and those measurements that you can measure, you find that they're very small. 
The diffusion constants are very small. The molecules move very slowly. Uh, in the best measurements that we have uh, from Thomas' uh, data and constructs suggest that the diffusion constants are of about the order of 0 0.3 micron squared per second, which is tenfold, twentyfold less than what you'd actually need to visibly establish the gradient. So a value of uh, 0 0.3 micron squared per second is too small. Molecules would move too slow. To, it would require several hours to produce a uh, gradient of, of the kind that we see in the uh, Drosophila egg. And yet we know that the gradient is already there and stable by cycle 10. And already uh, it's the effects of that gradient in terms of gene expression patterns are uh, also already established, uh, <coughs> already clearly visible at that stage. So we don't simply have enough time in development for a gradient to be, uh, to be established with diffusion constants that we see. And there are other theoretical considerations where, in which one uh, argues that the establishment of a stable gradient in some way balances the uh, the shape of that gradient somehow balances the movement of molecules versus their constant degradation. And under those circumstances, you would need uh, half-lifes to produce the visible shapes of the big wave gradient that we see. You would uh, require half-lifes that are extremely long if with, uh, for the big wave molecule to produce uh, uh, the gradients at any time in development to produce the gradients that we see. Uh, with a, a, a diffusion constant of 3.5. So all of that basically just raises the, uh, the, the basic uh, problem of it. Uh, we don't know really how molecules move in the egg and we don't really have good handles or good strategies for tracking individual molecules or even whole populations of molecules and knowing at what scale and over what time frames we have to measure uh, molecular movement. One of the other strategies that Thomas Greger took to uh, follow uh, movements of molecules involves uh, experiments where rather than looking at EGFP and making assumptions about its translation, RNA distribution, and movement from the eggs, what Thomas did was to take embryos, uh, wild-type embryos, and inject fluorescently labeled compounds into the anterior ends of the eggs. And you can see in this panel right here, the consequence of when you inject a dextran into the anterior end of the egg, you can see this biologically uh, uh, inert but fluorescent molecule moving through the whole volume of the egg. And you can follow the change in the distribution of these molecules over time. You can model them. What Thomas was able to show is when you take and inject dextran into the egg, it moves, can be modeled uh, uh, by its distribution over time, follows the, what was would be expected of, of simple diffusion, and allowed Thomas to calculate for dextrans of different sizes the uh, <coughs> diffusion constants for molecules. Uh, and what this uh, graph here shows is just some of Thomas's data for testing, for trying to model uh, bicoid movement by using uh, dextrans of approximately the size of a bicoid. So a bicoid uh, with EGFP would be about a 70 kilodalton protein, and so if you inject a dextrand of 70 kilodaltons into the egg and ask how fast does it move compared to what he was measuring with uh, EGFP bicoid. What Thomas saw that uh, in contrast to the 0.3 uh, uh, micron square per second diffusion constants that he obtained for bicoid at the surface of the egg in, in small and when photo bleaching small, small volumes of cytoplasm, the dextrans apparently move with uh, 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 diffusion constants with speeds of 15 micron square per second. 15 microns is more than enough what you need to make a gradient. And so this means that at least some molecules moving from the anterior into the egg are able to, uh, will uh, produce, can produce big, uh, gradients of the kind that we see with bicoid. Now, examination, uh, what, strictly speaking, what Thomas's measurements argue for dextran is that you can model 
the movement of injected dextrin as though it were diffusion. It doesn't actually tell you that the molecules are moving by diffusion rather than being transported or by binding to something or being moved by, by, other, by other mechanisms. One of the approaches, one of the strategies for testing whether you actually have whether the molecular movement that you're looking at in a biological system is due to uh, diffusion or due to Brownian motion, if you will, uh, is, to, is it size dependent? In that the Stokes Einstein relationship argues uh, uh, that uh, small molecules will diffuse faster, large molecules will diffuse, uh, diffuse more slowly, and that the diffusion constant that you measure will depend on the size of the molecules. And so the curve, as you see here, the, uh, you see the behavior of the diffusion constants that you measure for, with, uh, for dextrans at a small radii versus uh, large radii. And you can see the size dependence of those diffusion constants, which argues that a significant component of the movement that he's looking at really fits Stokes Einstein and really is uh, physical diffusion. But one of the other interesting things that arose from Thomas's analysis and by fitting these curves is that if you follow the shape of this curve out, as your molecules get um, bigger and bigger, what you find is that while the curve uh, can be fitted to a Stokes-Einstein relationship, it doesn't go down to zero. There's a floor. Uh, a a fraction of the movement of every one of these particles, which is size independent, meaning that about six microns squared per second of the movement of a molecule of about the size of uh, the radius of, of Bicoid is independent of, uh, of its actual size. And all molecules will be moving, are going to move in the egg at about six microns squared per second, independent of their size. This is actually a very intriguing observation for us because it suggests that a molecule, even a molecule like bicoid, that uh, over very, uh, that may show very slow diffusion constants, perhaps because it's interacting with or being bound to other molecules, and therefore will increase. Ultimately, you can explain that as having an increased size. If you look at, at uh, values like uh, the behavior here, this size independent movement might actually account for the movement of, of, of Bicoid. Now we don't know what the nature of the size independent movement is, but one model, it would, it would, all that we know is that it can't be explained by Brownian diffusion. But one of the interesting models, come, uh, one of the uh, interesting models may come back from the biological understanding of the phenomena. Because if you actually look at eggs during the process of um, early, uh, during the process when this gradient is being established, in a simple sense, if you, the way we've talked about it before, we've had a localized RNA, which is translated into a protein, and you have diffusion of this molecule through what you would think of as a stable cytoplasm, such that diffusion could establish a stable gradient. If you actually look, though, at embryos, during the process when this bicoid gradient is being established. And you look at the, the cytoplasm. We're looking here at an early cleavage division where nuclei, in fact, are uh, the, the, uh, in embryos where, uh, that carry a GFP histone. So we'll be able to eventually to see the nuclei, but you'll also see some GFP histone in the cytoplasm of these syncytial embryos. You can see the nuclei migrating out to the surface. And you can see this pattern of division of the individual nuclei that I talked about in the first lecture that give rise, these synchronous divisions that give rise to uh, early embryonic, uh, give rise to the, the, the syncytial blastoderm. But one of the things that you can also see, and I'll point this out to you in the neck, uh, we we'll watch the movie one more time, is that associated with these nuclear replications are massive movements of the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm moves forward and moves back in the swishing kind of turbulent uh, patterns that uh, appear to have no overall directionality, are not going to move molecules in any particular direction, but will, we believe, contribute, uh, uh, if bicoid is being a, is associated with the cytoplasm, will contribute 
to the movement of Bitcoin in a non-Brownian, non-diffusion sense, but in a, uh, a non-directed sense that would be essentially equivalent to a, a random walk, uh, the random walks that are produced by diffusion. And so what we're beginning to think now is that the Bitcoin gradient that arises in the egg does not ri arise necessarily from directly from diffusion or from the uh, diffusive movements of bicoid molecules per se, but is actually established by random movements in the cytoplasm. If that's true, then what it would argue is that the establishment of the gradient can't be understood from simple biophysical properties like diffusion, that it requires that the egg cytoplasm and the motors in the cytoplasm, maybe in an, a totally undirected way, but still that these cytoplasmic flows establish and move molecules like bicoid, and that the stable gradients that we see are the products more of that movement. We're beginning to try to test those models by asking can we inhibit the, this movement can we follow the establishment of gradients in unfertilized eggs where we see different patterns of movements? But it, the, the possibility that cytoplasmic movements, rather than simple diff physical diffusion, establish the bicoid gradient uh, is an intriguing possibility for us because it suggests that if um, biological parameters like cytoplasmic flows control the ultimate shape and distribution of bicoid, then those biological parameters are in fact can become immediate targets in a biological process if you wanted to change the shape of the bicoid gradient or have the bicoid gradient move uh, or have the, uh, during the course of evolution as eggs change or times change if you want to maintain or continue bicoid's usefulness to use bicoid as a morphogen, uh, as a control a molecule that, whose concentration establishes gene expression, you possibly want to be able to manipulate its distribution beyond those things that are possible by simple physical parameters like diffusion. So in the last, talk, last part of this lecture, I'll talk a little bit about what we've learned about how bicoid distributions have changed during evolution. <laughs>